So in Psalms, I'm actually going to start going through the book of Psalms on Sunday nights. Um, now, I'm not going to go through all 150 chapters all at once. Uh, I don't know if a lot of folks uh, may or may not know, but the book of Psalms is actually divided up into five different books uh, within the book of Psalms. So we're just going to be going through Psalms 1 through 42. And, you know, it's, it's a good book. It's a great book to go through, and you can get a lot of thoughts out of it. And uh, hopefully we can do that here tonight. So we're just going to get right into Psalms chapter 1 tonight. The Bible reads, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And, of course, what you need to notice here, uh, or what should be pointed out first of all, is this progression that you see here playing out in Scripture. He says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So you can kind of see this progression with this, uh, this man who's not allowing himself to be slowed down, coming to a stop, and then getting comfortable with a certain type of people. And of course, those people are you know, the counsel of the ungodly, the way of sinners, or in the seat of the scornful. So if you notice there, you know, he's saying, hey, don't walk in their counsel. You know, don't, don't walk after the world, walk after the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. And this is really what you can learn from this is that, you know, bad people or sinners, they tend to slow us down, they tend to drag us down, and then eventually they bring us to a stop. If you notice, he's walking, he's standing, and then at last, he, he, he's finally sitting. You know, he's become completely idle. He's not going in the right direction at all. In fact, he's just come to a complete stop in his life. And, you know, part of the blessed, the, 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 the blessed man, what makes him so blessed is that he's not, it's not necessarily what he is doing in this instance, although off, obviously that, has a pl- that plays a part in it, but it's, it's what he's not doing in this passage. The blessed man is not in the counsel of the ungodly. You know, he's not getting his counsel and his advice from the world, not to say that the world doesn't have some good advice in some areas that we could definitely take and apply to our lives, but when it comes to the, th- to the things that, that uh, of God, when it comes to the things of the Lord, of Christian living, you know, that trumps anything that the world has to offer. And usually what happens, what you'll find is when you find some bit of worldly advice or worldly counsel that's coming from a worldly source, often whether they know it or not, what they're teaching is lining up with Scripture in some way. They've actually, they've actually without even knowing it, begun to implement a biblical principle in their own life, whether it's in the area of child rearing, marriage, finances, all these areas that we have to deal with from day to day. And he's saying, look, the blessed man is the man who does not walk in that way. He does not allowing the counsel of the ungodly to trump the counsel of God. Nor standeth in the way of sinners. You know, he's, you can get the picture of a guy just kind of standing. You know, he's getting comfortable with them, getting comfortable in their sin, you know, getting comfortable around being around wicked people. You're standing there. And at last, he's sitting in the seat of the scornful. You've gone from people who are just ungodly, have a worldly wisdom, to now you're being involved with people who are involved in sin, the way of sinners, and at last you find yourself in the seat of the scornful. People who are not just ungodly, people who are not just sinners, but are actually mockers, scorners of God and God's people. Those that are despisers, despisers of those that are good. You know, if we ever find ourselves in that seat, we need to get up. You know, we need to get up immediately and and say, whoa, wait a minute, what am I doing here? And, you know, often we find, you can find a lot of that in, you know, today, the, the worldly entertainment of today, worldly movies and things like that, where there is a lot of mocking of God's word. There's a lot of mocking of God's people and the Lord himself. And Christians, unfortunately, they'll sit right down and they'll, let, they'll just take that all in. And what are they doing? You're sitting in the seat of the scornful. And you might even, you could even get to the place where the Christian joins in on that to some degree or another. But notice it's a progression. You're not just going to wake up one day and find yourself sitting with a bunch of, you know, God-hating mockers and scoffers of the world and participating in that sin. First, it's walking in the counsel of the ungodly. Well, maybe they're just better at this one area. Maybe there's something I can glean from them. And then they start to get your ear and you're walking with them. Then they slow you down to your standing. And now you're actually getting involved in some sin and finally sitting down. And the other thing to notice here, and if you would, go over to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, is that the bad make the good bad. And this is something that people need to understand, is that the bad make the good bad. It never works the other way around. 
And, you know, and this is important to understand in a day where we're having, you know, people promote this lifestyle type evangelism. Where we're just, you know, we're just going to get close to, to wicked people and we're just going to win them over by showing how them, you know, how we can go to the bar and not drink and be a test. They go, why, how do you go to the bar and not drink? You know, tell me more about your God. That's not going to happen. You know, or go get involved in whatever godly, ungodly activity there is and then say, well, they're, they're going to just marvel at how I'm there but not participating or something like that. But the bad make the good bad every single time. It's never the other way around. You see that all throughout Scripture. You know, you can look at the children of Israel, a perfect example of that. That's why God wanted the heathen driven completely out of the land. And when they failed to do that, what happened is that eventually the bad made the good bad. It's always that way. <coughs> look at Proverbs chapter 1, verse 10. He said, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. He's saying, don't go along with them. And look, here's the thing. Sinners are going to entice us. They're going to entice you. They're going to go out there and they're going to try to get you to do wicked things. Especially, and it's even worse when they find out you're a Christian. When they find out, you know, oh, you grew up in a godly home, you've never done this and you've never done that, you've never seen this and you've never heard that. Now, a lot of times it can turn into these ungodly people, these wicked people, it can almost become a game. Who can get so-and-so, to, to this, this godly Christian, to fall first? And they enjoy it. They get a kick out of it. You know, they want to be the ones to say that, hey, we got so-and-so, they're, you know, drunk or whatever for the first time. You know, they, they, they make a game out of it. <laughs> I remember being on the job site, and guys, you know, would appreciate my sense of humor. And then they would say, boy, boy, Corbin, I bet you're a lot funnier when you're drunk. I bet you're a lot funnier if we could just get a few more in Corbin. He'd probably be even a, fun, even a funnier guy. And they, you know, we'd be working out of town, and they would be like, why don't you come out to the, come out to the restaurant and have a few with us? I said, no, I'm just going back to the hotel, and I'll eat Wendy's by myself. You know, I'll eat some fast food in the hotel by myself or whatever. And really what happens eventually is that they kind of get tired of that. They get tired, oh, he's, he, so-and-so's not going to go along with this. And then you just, you know, you become a, potentially, you know, the stick in the mud, the the, the, the object of ridicule and scorn. You know, that, well, if we can't, we can't get them over onto our side, well, let's just mock them. You know, but then they become scornful. But he's saying, look, if sinners entice thee, and mark it down that sinners are going to entice you. That's why you shouldn't walk with them. That's why you shouldn't uh, stand with them, and that's why you shouldn't sit with them. Because they're not there to sit at your feet and learn of, of the Lord. They're not there to you know, take in your righteous living and, and try to follow your example. They, they want to entice you. That's what they want to do. That's why you shouldn't be around them. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that get down to the pit. So obviously these are guys that are involved in some pretty wicked sin. They're talking about robbery, murder, you know, basically a gang. You know, they're, in, they're getting into criminal activity. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us, let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. He didn't say, go there and try to be a light, try to be a witness, try to tell them what they're doing is wrong. He's saying, look, don't even go near it. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird, and they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. Talking about the fact that he that liveth by the sword shall die by the sword that they're not going to get away with this, that they're going to get caught, and they're going to go down. And he's saying, look, walk not in the way with them. Consent thou not. Don't have anything to do with wicked people. And we shouldn't get it in our head that we're going to reform these people. Look, preach them the gospel, get them saved, tell them about church, invite them to church, give them some sound biblical preaching, or you know, do something like that along that nature, but let's not make uh, you know, our life's endeavor trying to reform wicked people because it, it's just it's not going to work out they're going to have an effect on us because the bible teaches us and if you would go over to second corinthians chapter six second corinthians chapter six that we are called to be separate from sinners this doctrine of separation in the christian life we're to be separate from sinners i remember when i first you know, I got saved, decided I'm going to start going to church and living for the Lord, and I gave up all these old friends. You know, they, they, were, they didn't applaud me. 
They didn't send me greeting, you know, nice cards. Hey, so glad to hear you've turned your life around. Glad to hear you've gotten away from all the sin that you're involved. We were in, involved in together, and are off living for the Lord. They weren't. They weren't pleased with that. They didn't applaud me. You know, you start to hear, oh, they, you're just some holier than thou. I remember I had one friend. I, his mother was a Christian. She was actually a an, a pretty big influence on, on me early on, and she said, and she said. Uh, you know, I said, well, they all think that, they're, that I'm more righteous than them now. They're saying, oh, we don't hang out with, with him because he's so righteous now. And she said, well, you know what? You're, they're right. <laughs> I don't know how to take it at a time, you know, but I, and without trying to sound haughty, I was like, well, I thought about it. I'm like, yeah, she is right. I, I am living more righteously now. I mean, that's just the fact. I'm not running around, hanging out at all hours of the night, doing all these things that these guys like to do. I don't do that. You know, the, uh, that, that's called righteous living, clean living, godly living. So, yeah, you're right, I don't. You know, and we're called to that life as Christians. You know, we're not called to that to get saved. But we don't want to just get this idea that, well, you know, salvation's by grace through faith. We're going to heaven no matter what. And, you know, it doesn't matter how I live, I'm going to heaven. Yeah, that's true, but it does matter how you live in terms of how your life's going to turn out. What kind of life you're going to live here on this earth. You know, you can be a saved Christian and have a long, miserable life. You can have a long, sin-wracked life just full of disappointment and heartache even as a Christian and still go to heaven. We still have that decision to make and part of the, one of the decisions we have to make in the Christian life is to not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, to not stand with sinners and to not sit in the seat of the scornful. <clears throat> and that's a blessing in and of itself. Just putting off all those things that you were going to get involved in, getting away from all those bad influences that are just going to drag us down, that in and of itself is a blessing. Even if I don't have a bunch of money and life's just one long cakewalk, from, you know, as long as I'm not involved in all that, that's a blessing in and of itself. That's the blessed man right there, the one who's not involved in all these things. The man who's obeyed this command to be separate from sinners. And it's a command, look there in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, what's a yoke? He's not talking about an egg here. He's talking about you know, that, that piece of equipment that they would put on, on beasts of burden and cause them to, a yoke to, to plow together. He's saying, don't get in the same yoke with them. Don't stay, you, know, you get the idea, again, of walking in the way with them, plowing the same path, hitching up with them, working towards the same end, side by side. We're going to work together. Be not unequally yoked together with them, with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? This is, this is the contrast that Paul is drawing here. When a, when a Christian, when a believer gets yoked up with an unbeliever, it's as if righteousness has yoked up with unrighteousness. I mean, look at the, look at the, uh, the uh, comparison that he, he draws here. At what communion with, hath light with darkness? He says they're worlds apart. There's nothing similar there. A Christian and a non-Christian, it's like light and darkness. It's day and night. It's black and white. It's that simple. What concord hath Christ with Belial, you know, the devil? Or what part he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. He said, oh, I don't want to separate. Why do I have to not... Why can't I yoke up? Why can't I walk with sinners? Why can't I stand in the way with them? Why can't I sit in the seat of scornful? Because you are not your own. You've been bought with the price as the precious blood of a lamb. Without, you know, without, without spot, without blemish. You know, you're God's temple. You're the temple of the living God. And He lives in you by the Holy Spirit. So are we going to take that Holy Spirit, take this temple that is now the Lord's, and, and join it unto the temple of the devil with Belial? Are we going to take light and try to merge it together with darkness? Look, that's the comparison he's drawing here, and that's what happens when an unbeliever yokes up with a believer, or vice versa. You know, and the one area this is probably most applicable is marriage. You know, this is a, a sure recipe for disaster in the Christian life when a believer gets yoked up with an unbeliever because, you know, they like the way the other one looks. Or something, some shallow thing like that. 
And they never think, well, you know, I'm, they're not saved, but I'll get them saved down the road and we'll work all that out. There's no guarantee of that. You know, now the, now the believer wants to fulfill their God-given role, man or woman, and the other one doesn't want to go along with it because they're darkness, because they, they're not righteous, because they're not light. They're not, you know, they're not of God. They're an unbeliever. But you're in the yoke with them now. You're stuck. <laughs> and now you have to, now life's going to be pretty tough, isn't it? Imagine, you know, having a couple of oxen or whatever in a yoke, and they both want to go two different directions. Imagine what that furrow is going to look like. How productive is that farm going to be when the, when the beasts of burden are fighting with each other? You can't even get them in the yoke. They're, they're kicking each other in the stall or whatever. This kind of thing, you know, this is, this is just practical application here. This is what happens in, in marriages quite often. As people, they, you know, or maybe they get saved later in life. You know, that's sometimes these things can't be helped, I understand. And that's really a whole sermon in and of itself, just to deal with that one topic. But look, if we're going to, you know, if we're going to seek a spouse, if we're going to get married to somebody, the first thing we should find out is whether or not they're saved. You know, and I would go beyond that and even find out, well, do they love the Lord? Do they want to live for God? What's your take on child rearing? What's your take on biblical roles as husbands and wives and so on and so forth? These are the things that have to be discussed in advance. And make sure you understand that what you're getting involved in. So, you know, that's just a practical application right there. But the, the, the commandment here, overarching commandment is this, is that we are not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Because that would be walking in the counsel of the ungodly. That would be standing in the way with sinners. That would be sitting in the seat of the scornful. And people don't like this. And go over to 1 Peter chapter 4. This rubs people the wrong way often. And, you know, a lot of, you know, neo-evangelical Christianity, a lot of mainstream, non-denominational Churches today, they can't stand this kind of teaching <coughs> because they want to be just like the world. They want to look like the world. They want to talk like the world. They want to act like the world. They want to do what the world does. They want their cake and they want, to eat, they want their cake and they want to be able to eat it too. You know, but that's not what God has called us to. God has called us to be separate. And the, and, and the worldly Christians, they don't like this because why? Because when you are separate, it draws attention. Look, use the analogy of what hath light, what conquer hath light with darkness. I mean, if you were in darkness, you know, and I just turned on a lamp or turned on a light, a flashlight of some kind, it would stand out. It would draw attention, wouldn't it? I mean, think about when you flip on the light at home at night, the porch light. What happens? All those bugs come in, right? It draws attention. And that's the same way in the Christian life. If you're going to walk through this world, this present evil world that the Bible says li that the whole world lieth iniquity, lieth in iniquity, that we are lights in this world. We are as a city set on a hill. You know, that we are, we are the light of the world. That if we are to go through this world in a dark world as lights, don't you think we're going to draw some attention? Don't you people are going to go, there's something different about that guy, about that girl? about that family. There's just something different about them. They're not, they're not doing the same things, participating in the same things. They don't talk the way we talk. They don't act the way we act. They're different. And again, they're, they're, you know, the world's going to notice that, but they're like that bug. You know, they're not there to admire it. They're just, you know, they're, they're gross. <laughs> they're drawn to it and they just say, ah, what's that? You know, they're just there to kind of be annoying. The world's not just going to embrace your, how different you are. And that's why so much of Christianity today, they shun this. They say, no, no, no. You know, it's more important that we look like, you know, we got we to gotta reach them where they are. Well, you know, you can reach them where they are on Sunday afternoons, Thursday evenings, Saturday afternoons, mornings, whenever, when we go out door knocking. You want to talk about reaching where they are, you know, we take that literally here. And you go find them where they are physically and reach them with the gospel. We don't go try and match you know, their dress, the way they live, the activities that they're involved in. You know, let's, go down to the, let's all just go down to the bar and see how many people we can win to the Lord. People don't go to the bar to hear the gospel, friend. You think it's unreceptive when they're at home. They're sure not going to listen to it sitting on some bar stool somewhere. It's, it's stupid. And I bring that up because that is a, that I've, I've seen that with Christians. <laughs> but look, this, this separation from sinners, this is going to draw attention to you. 
Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? He's saying, look, just as much as Christ hath suffered in the flesh. Say, well, I, I thought the Christian life was just going to be easy. Suffering? What? Living for the Lord and suffering? Suffering? I don't, know if I'm, I don't know if I'm up for that. Well, you know what? Christ suffered in the flesh. For us. He was willing to do that. Look, the Lord's not asking you to do anything that he hasn't done. And until they're you know, whipping you and, and spitting in your face and you know, beating a crown of thorns into your skull and crucifying you, you know, and shoving a spear in your side, you haven't even begun to suffer to the degree that he has. And we don't want to. We don't want to suffer because we're afraid somebody might go. <laughs> you see what they're wearing? <laughs> do you hear what so and so doesn't do this? Can you believe it? <laughs> Corbin won't go to the bar with us. He's some kind of Mormon or something, or whatever. They make up. You know, they make jokes. They laugh. They ridicule. They mock. But we have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin, like Christ has. And he's saying, look, as much as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. Arm yourselves with the same mind. Saying this, be ready to suffer. Go into it saying, I'm going to live for the Lord. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be like the blessed man that walketh not in the counsel of the godly, nor standeth the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. I'm not going to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. I'm going to be different. I'm going to live for the Lord. And I'm just going to arm myself now going into it, knowing that somewhere along the line, it's going to rub some people the wrong way. That I'm going to get mocked for it. That I'm going to get ridiculed. You know, and of course we understand that there will be a generation that will be, and there have been generations, and even places in this world today that do suffer physical persecution for being different in this way, for being Christians. <coughs> he says here, arm yourselves with this likewise the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his life, uh, excuse me, the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. You know, it's not our, our life isn't our, this, this, the rest of this life that we have isn't ours to just waste living to the lust of men. Just fulfilling whatever lust that the world offers up. Satisfying whatever, you know, pleasure they want to offer us. And indulging in everything. Look, he suffers, he, he lives the rest of his life in the flesh to the, lust of men, to the lust of men, but to the will of God. That's what we're here to do as Christians. We're here to live for God. For the time of our past, the past of our life may suffice us to have right, wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. And look at verse 4. Wherein they think it strange that ye run not to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. So these people, you know, they got right with God. They got saved. They decided to start living for the Lord. And they said, enough of the old man, enough of the old life. I'm not doing those things anymore. I'm not going to live the rest of the time of this life in the lust of men. And he explains all the, the, the lust that they were involved in. And he says, and the people that you used to hang out with, what do they do? They think it's strange. They say, what an odd duck you've become. You've changed. Man, you're weird. Where's the old guy? I remember being told, you know, the old you would make fun of, or the new you Excuse me. The old you would make fun of the new you. He said, yeah, he would have, but this is who I am now. And the old me was wrong. So we are to not be yoked up with unbelievers. We're to be separate from sinners. Now let me just say this. You go over to John chapter 17 and, and, and keep something. Oh, you've already turned from there. Anyway, just go to John 17. When you get there, put a bookmark, but... We are to be separate, but let's not go to an unrealistic extreme. You know, people sometimes in their minds can go can take this to an unrealistic extreme. You know, we're not, now we're all just going to buy a compound somewhere and, and shut ourselves off from the rest of the world. Okay, now we're this close from being a cult at that point. You know, in, in all likelihood we are. And that's not us. That's not what we're here to do. We still have to be in this world. Don't take this to an unrealistic extreme. You know, you're still going to have to get up and go to work. And I, I'm guessing everybody at work isn't saved. You know, we're all going to have to interact with people on a day-to-day -day basis. 
of people in this world that aren't saved. And we can't say, well, you know, before we, I talk to you, can I just ask you, are you 100% sure you're going to heaven? Well, you know, I, w- I would love to, you know, you know com- uh, complete this bank transaction, tell her, but until you get saved, I can't be, you know, yoked up with you. Uh, you know, obviously that's, that's insane to think like that along those lines. And you say, why even bring that up? Because people go there. They're called cults. People go to that extreme where now they're just going to shut off everybody that isn't just like them. But here's the problem with that. You can't, you can't reach the lost with that kind of mentality to take this to an unrealistic extreme. Look what Jesus said in John 17. He said, I have, verse 14, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated, hath hated them. What? <laughs> There's more of that suffering that we were talking about. Because they are not of the world. Why did the world hate them? Because they're not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. The world doesn't like it when you're different. The world doesn't like it when you live for the Lord. Because often what that does is it shines a light on their own wickedness. They're convinced of their own conscience. He said, I pray that not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. He's not saying, look, look, I don't want them to go live under a, you know, an underpass somewhere and never talk to anybody again that isn't saved. But thou that shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify through thy, thy word, thy, wor- thy truth, thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so also I have sent them. I also have sent them into the world. So we're to be in the world, folks, but we're not to be of the world. Does that make sense? We're to be in this world. We still have to interact with people. We still have to go through our day by day. We still have to get along. But here's the thing. We don't have to be just like them. You know, we should be light, a light that shines in a dark place. We should not put that light under a bushel, is what we're saying here tonight. Let that light shine. Go ahead, be different. (coughs) Just be ready for the backlash. Just be ready for when people say, that's too bright. Can you tone it down a little bit? No, I can't. I can't. So right out of the gate here in Psalms 1, if you would, go over to 2 Corinthians, bookmark seven, John 17, but go over to 2 Corinthians 6, where I had earlier. You see right away that the blessed man is the man who does not walk with ungodly sinners and scorners. He doesn't get comfortable with the wicked people of this world. He doesn't make them their best friends, and he sure doesn't marry them. They don't, get, they don't hook up and hang out and make them their best friends. You know, they probably have to go to work, they have to interact, so on and so forth, but they go into that to be a light. They avoid evil, right? But I want to go on here in Psalms chapter 2, or Psalms chapter 1, rather, in verse 2, and, and just explain that, you know, it's not enough to just avoid evil. You have to delight in the good. And, you know, people really struggle in their life. They, this is where people really start to struggle with sin and things like that. <laughs> You know, habitual sins, things that they've, you know, been addicted to or have a history with. You know, this is, this is something that would really help people if they, if they struggle with that type of thing. Is this idea that you can't, you can't just go through your life avoiding evil. I'm not going to sin, I'm not going to sin, I'm not going to sin. Because now you're just always thinking about how you're not going to commit that one sin that you, that you enjoyed so much in the past that you're so comfortable with that's so easy for you to get back involved in. And just sit there and thinking about it, thinking about how I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. And you know what you're going to end up doing? You're going to end up doing it. Because it's not enough to just avoid evil. It's not enough to say, well, I'm not going to walk in the counsel of the godly. I'm not going to stand to see this. Uh, 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 I'm not going to, uh, or stand in the way of the sinners. I'm not going to sin to see this scornful. I'm not going to do that. You can't just leave this void in your life. You have to fill that void. You know, and a lot of times when you say, I'm not going to walk the counsel of the godly, I'm not going to stand in the way of sinners, I'm not going to see, see the scornful. You do that, that's great, but what you end up doing is you make a void in your life. Maybe you have to cut some people out and say, I'm sorry, I can't hang out, I can't go there, I can't do that, I can't participate because I can't be, I, I can't yoke up with unbelievers in that way. And when you do that, often what happens is you make a void in your life. Now there's this vacuum where there's something's got to fill that. And if we don't fill it with something good, the old stuff's going to just get sucked right back in. It's not enough to avoid the evil. You must delight in the good. 
Notice in verse 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. It doesn't end there. Verse 2, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. So you've got to fill that void with something. You can't just you know, cut yourself off from this, separate as you should, and then just leave this void here. You have to fill it with something. And, you know, and this is why church is so important. This is why church is important. And this is why so many people, so many Christians are going to struggle in their Christian life and find themselves right back living an ungodly life is because you know, they try to make these changes, but then they just kind of take church for granted and they, start, they drop out of church, and they quit church, and I guarantee it, they're going to end up right back where they were. Because you can't live in, with this vacuum in your life. Now where, now, where else in the world are you going to find godly, righteous people to take that place? Where, where are you going to stand and walk and sit with God's people? Where else than besides church? It's, you're not going to find it anywhere else. Show me where it is. There, it's, it's nowhere else but in God's house. See, that's why, you know, when people are out of church, you can just mark it down. Backslidden. Or it's just a matter of time till they're backslidden. And that's why it's important to just, even when you don't feel like it, to drag your carcass here. You know, it's my, you say, well, we're here because we, you know, we don't want you to get all down in the mouth about not being here. Look, it's my job to be here. But you know why it's my job to be here? To preach to people that should be here. Because <laughs> they need it. We all need this. I mean, that's when I made the changes in my life. I mean, I was saved for a while, but it wasn't until I got in church that I started to really make some progress in the Christian life. Up then, it was just this herky-jerky back and forth with sin and with living for the Lord. But when you get in a church where there's preaching, where there's fellowship, where there's activity, where there's something going on, that can fill that void. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the godly, we understand that, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. You have to learn to delight in something. We're going to delight in something in this life. We're going to take pleasure in something. It ought to be to the things of God. <clears throat> you have to delight in the good. And in his law doth he meditate. You're in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse 17. He says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and you should be me, my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So there again, another commandment. And if you would go over to 1 Peter chapter 3, that we are to come out and to be separate. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. To come out from among them. To be separate. Why? And to touch not the unclean. Why? Why separate? Why leave the unclean thing? And I will receive you. And people struggle with this because they have a hard time of understanding. They think it's just all about the Christian's life just not having fun. <laughs> you know, well, one, first of all, life's not just all about fun. Okay? Life isn't just one giant, you know, thrill ride that, that everyone's here just here to entertain us. There's certainly fun to be had. But people say, oh, well, you know, you're the Christian life, they just, they just want to spoil all the fun by, you know, telling us to come, you know, be separate, not touch the unclean thing. But people who get that attitude, what they're doing is they're focusing too much on what they're giving up. They think all they're thinking about is what they're not, what they're missing out on. And often all they think about is the pleasures that that sin brings. Because, you know, I'd be, I'm not going to sit and lie to you and say that, that there isn't pleasure in sin. Obviously there is. Why else do you think the world just goes to great lengths to enjoy it as much as they can? Of course there's pleasure in sin for a season. So he's saying, look, you know, people get, this, people get this attitude, this mentality of, well, you know, I don't want to separate because it's just all these things that I have to give up, all the stuff I'm missing out on. You've got to change that. You have to understand what are you gaining. And this is the part that people struggle with because the, what you're gaining is not tangible uh, so often. It's spiritual in nature. It's something that you might not even really fully comprehend or understand until you die and go to heaven when the Lord returns. We won't fully understand what we have in Christ until we are in Christ's presence. But he says there to, to, to not touch the unclean. And what does he say there? And I will receive you. Who's the I there? It's God. It's the Lord. 
Oh, I got to give up all these old friends. I got to, you know, quit doing this and quit doing that. Yeah, but God receives you. God, the Lord. Sounds like a good trade to me. But people struggle with this because they cannot see afar off. They can't see that because God's not going to show up, knock on the door, and sit down and you know play a game of Scrabble and hang out. But you can have good, godly Christian friends that will have good, clean, wholesome fun. And you know what? You can have a lot of fun without having getting involved in all the things that the world does. You know, I'll just say that right here, right here now, is that I've had more fun as a, fun as a Christian than I've ever had as a non-Christian. You know, the reason why they have to take all the drugs and the alcohol is because they're bored. Because they, they, they're unsatisfied. It's the truth. I've had more fun as a Christian living a clean life than I ever had unsaved. And you know what? And here's the best part out of it. It's all guilt-free. It's guilt-free. It's the best part. You don't wake up in the morning and go, oh, why did I do that? And feel shame. Or have some, you know, lifelong repercussion because you wanted to go out and have some fun one night. Look over to 1 Peter chapter, thir- ch- chapter 3. Look, it's great to separate. It's great to get away from the, 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 the sinners and the scornful and all that. But you have to fill that void. You have to love, you have to meditate in God's word. You have to love the things of the Lord. Separate from them and he will receive you. Understand that you are being received by God. That you're, ha- you're walking as a new man in Christ. That there's a new life that you're living. He says, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, that his lips and his lips that they speak no, di- no guile. Excuse me, look at verse 11. This is what he's talking about. What he's talking about? The guy that wants to live a good life, that wants to love life, that doesn't want life to just turn into this loathsome endeavor that he has to just bear. They just get through. Look, people live this. People are miserable out there. People live lives that they hate. And the only thing that's keeping them from just ending it all is the fear of death. There's people that, and look, the guy that wants to love life, not just go through life like it's just some chore and see good days. He says, let him refrain his tongue from evil, let him, that his lips speak no God, let him askew evil. It goes right back to what we are talking about. The blessed man who eschews evil does not sit with the, the, the scorn, doesn't sit, walk, stand with sinners, all that. He eschews evil, but what is the other part of the equation? Look there at verse 11. He is, let him askew evil and do good. See how he's filling that void? See how it's two things? It's the skewing of evil and the doing it. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. You say, oh, I'm giving up this wicked, ungodly life. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to get the sin out. Why? You know, it's, it's, it's so hard. I feel like I'm giving so much. Yeah, but God's going to hear you. The Bible says if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord's not going to hear me. That even my prayer shall be an abomination if I regard iniquity in my heart. Look, the, the, one of the benefits of eschewing evil, not standing with the sinners, and so on and so forth, of getting away from that and doing good, is that God, when you separate, is that God honors that. And God hears you. Who do you want to hear you tonight? Some group of drunks at a karaoke bar somewhere? Do you want them to hear you strangle a cat up there? In a place that smells like piss? And, and cigarettes, and everyone's miserable, and it's dark. That's who I want to hear me. Well, you know what? You can have that. It's out there. That's easy to get. But you know, the eyes of the Lord are over the open, are are are, are over the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers. That's a lot better, more satisfying, reassuring thought and knowledge to know that it, God is hearing you, because you're not down there strangling the cat at the karaoke bar. Because you're skewing evil. Because you're doing good. Because you're seeking peace and you're ensuing it. <clears throat> but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. 
So it's really clear here in Psalms chapter 1 that, you know, there's, that sin has to be purposefully avoided. You're not just going to get sin out of your life just by accident. People don't, don't, don't move on and get sins out of life permanently by accident. You know, that's why, and I want to preach this whole sermon on the stupid doctrine of deliverance. You know, people that teach God's people that, oh, that, you know, I get saved and then just sins are just gone. Baloney. And all you're doing is setting people up for failure. These deliverance doctrines. And they're often not even saved because they preach, you know, this repent of your sin stuff. And say, oh, you can't tell people they can do whatever they want or they go to, and go to heaven. Otherwise, they'll, just, they'll still be junkies. You don't know that. That's not true. Look, saved people can still be junkies. Because sin has to be purposely avoided. Because there's no such thing as just being delivered miraculously from sin. Now, we understand that, you know, God, uh, you know, that, it, it, you know, God will, will make a way. He will not allow us to be tempted above that we are able, but will with that temptation make a way to escape. That we may be able to bear it. You know, but it doesn't say he's going to take away that temptation completely. You know, often God, in fact, lets these temptations stay in our life. Why? So that we will seek a way to escape. The way that he provides. And often, you know, that way to escape is prayer. And seeking the Lord. And meditating on his word. That's how you get delivered from these, these sins. You know, and they're never really gone completely, are they? They're always there. They're always there. But they have to be purposely avoided. Why? Because of its appeal. Because sin has an appeal. Go over to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, By faith, by faith Moses, when he has come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction. So here's, a, here's an example of a man who said, I'm not going to stand in the seat of the scornful. Or stand in the seat of, uh, I'm not going to stand with sinners. I'm not going to sit in the seat of the scornful. I'm not going to be like these Egyptians, these scoffers who mock God and, and say God's a cow or some crazy thing like that. He's saying, look, I'm not going, I'm going to refuse to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. But what did he choose? Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. So again, it's all tying together here in, in Moses' life. You know, eschewing the evil, choosing the good, but understanding he had to arm himself with that same mind that he's going to suffer as God's people. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You know, sin has its pleasures, but then it's gone. It's over. When we suffer for the Lord and we suffer with God's people, there is an eternal reward. But here's why people miss out on it, because it's a delayed gratification. It's not immediate. It's something that we might not even know or experience or enjoy until we get to heaven. And a lot of Christians, that's not good enough for them. They say, well, I want it now. Because that's what we've been trained, that's what we've been brought up. He's saying, look, he chose rather to suffer affliction than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of reward. We just that's the that's the secret right there, isn't it? We gotta get that that understanding of the recompense of the reward, what we truly have, what awaits us, and then we would be able to esteem that greater riches. People don't esteem it greater riches to live for Lord. They esteem the pleasures of sin greater because they can't see it. Look at James chapter 1. He says in verse 13, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Look, sin has to be purposely avoided because it, it, it's, it's something that comes from with us. He, it, it says there, that every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. It's the things that come of our own heart. You have to purposely avoid sin. One, because of its appeal. And two, because of the fact that we are sinners by nature. That we still have this old man that's going to fight us every step of the way. And the more we feed him and the stronger we make the old man, the harder he is to fight. You know, and some of, you know, sometimes Christians get this place where the old man, he's a sumo wrestler. I mean, he's just this giant. 
Because they've been feeding him all the lust. They've been feeding him and strengthening him and giving in to every temptation and just saying, and he's just gotten big and strong and he just has their way. But then they got this new man who they've not been feeding, who they've not been nurturing, who they've not been strengthening, and he's just this skinny little wimp. What chance does he have? You've got to start to tip the scales. By, you know, and how do you do that? Starve the old man. Put him on a caloric deficit. Put him on a, a caloric deficit. A put, you know, put him on a sin deficit. And start whittling that guy down and tip the scales. And then you know, start beefing up the new man. Say, you know what? I, I know I'm usually not, I, I'm not at church you know, on, on such and such time because I'm too busy doing this or that. You need, to, you need to start feeding the new man. Start getting him some spiritual manna. I used to get up in the morning and just, you know, smoke a cigarette and stand out on the porch and drink a cup of coffee and whatever. You know what? You need to stop feeding the old man and start getting up in the morning and start feeding the new man. Start strengthening him. Start giving him some spiritual nutrition. If you ever want to tip that scale and actually start to get some victories. Because you're not going to just avoid sin automatically. It has to be purposely avoided. And you have to take actual, you know, measurable steps, purposeful steps, in order to accomplish that, in order to get past that. And this, you know, the trade is more than worth it. The trade is worth it. I mean, go back to, go back to uh, I had to show you, I kept seeing it in John, but if you, get, if you got anything in John, keep it there in, in chapter 16, but go back. Uh, go back to, to Psalms chapter uh, 1. Look, the trade's worth it, my friend. What happens when you purposely avoid the sin, when you skew evil? What happens when the blessed man doesn't walk in the counsel of the godly, when he doesn't stand in the, seat of sin, or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of the scornful? What happens when, when, he, when his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night? What happens? There's a trade you know, it, it, it's, it's worth it. Look at verse 3. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, which bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not weather. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I mean, who wouldn't want that for their life? To be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. You know, they're get, it's getting the, 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 the roots in the Christian life are getting the spiritual nourishment that it needs. Because now, instead of doing all these things that we used to do, now we're reading our Bibles, now we're praying, now we're going to church, so on and so forth. You say, those sound pretty basic and simple. Yeah, but they're the backbone of the Christian life. They're, they're, the, they're the roots of the Christian life. That's the river that's going to keep you fed and make you like a tree that brings forth his fruit in his season, and his leaf also shall not wither, Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You look, that's what's waiting for the guy or gal who decides that they're going to not stand in the, you know, not, not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, but rather are going to separate, come out from among them, and actually going to live a godly life. And no, they're not going to enjoy all the pleasures that the, of sin that the world is enjoying, but you know what? They're also not going to have a lot of the headaches. And that's what's always just blown my mind about alcohol with people, even in my own family. Like, how, 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 is, how are we, how are my siblings, and, you know, it's really down to one at this point, still doing the things that the previous generation did? I mean, I talk to my aunts, and, all, and I, I hear the stories, I'm just going, and I see the way their lives turn out, the divorce and the adultery and the, the, the way the kids have turned. I mean, it's just like... Why are we repeating this? Why, do we, why are we still doing this? People would say, well, they still go back to that bottle full knowing what, what lies in store for them. What's at the bottom of that bottle? Heartache, pain, regret, shame. But you know what? When they first crack it open, all they, all they hear and see is the pleasures of sin. The pleasure that's awaiting them. They just they don't want to. They don't think about all that because on the way down they're not thinking about that. But when that last drop is gone, and now it's time for all these things to start to just the bill comes due, so to speak. You know, then they're miserable. 
And you have to just, and you scratch your head and go, why? Why are they doing it? Why would we continue to repeat the, the same sins that this, that this last generation, and we saw what happened, we even on the receiving end of it, you know, victims of somebody else's alcoholism. Why are we still going down that? Because I'm not so stupid to sit here and say that there isn't pleasures in sin for a season. But it's not worth it. It's certainly not worth it. Because sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. It bringeth forth death. But you know, the guy who separates, gets away from all that, what is, he's like that tree. It's planted by rivers of water. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Look at verse 4. The ungodly are not so. The ungodly are not so. This is not what's waiting for them. This is not the outcome that they're going to have in life. Oh, it might look like a lot of fun. They might be living it up in their 20s. It might look like a lot of fun. They're living up in their 30s. Yeah, they have a little bit more problems, but you know, so what? Who doesn't? Oh, now it's starting. Now you get in your 40s. Now it's starting to kind of look pathetic. Now it's your 50s. Now we're just concerned in 60s. Who knows? People drink themselves to death by that age. Literally. I've seen it more than once. The godly are not so. They think, you know, the party's not, uh, newsflash, the party's not going to last forever. Even the bar closes at a certain time and says you can't stay here. The ungodly are not so, but what are they like? They're like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Just dried up, wrinkly, crusty, no substance, no nutrients, worthless, that just whew, the wind drives away. What does the wind do when it comes up against a big tree that's got strong roots? Man, it might make it sway a little bit. Can't blow it over. It's certainly not. You wouldn't say it's going to drive it away. But when it gets to, hits that chaff that's loose, that has no roots, has no water, has no source keeping it fed, when it's all dried out and, and old and useless, it's just gone. Effortlessly. They're swept away. That's what the ungodly are like. The problem, you know, the Christians of the world you know, that they seem to have is they don't see that because they don't start out like that often. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. And you know what? When that happens, on that day, when the, when the, when the, when the congregation of the righteous are gathered together and the ungodly are brought there and, and the books are opened and everyone's judged, they're going to wish... They could stand where you're standing even for a second. They would give it all up. If they could go back and do it all over again, they would to stand where you're going to be standing for just one second. But you know what? They're not going to. They're not going to stand in the congregation of the righteous. So you know what? When we say, I'm going to separate, I'm going to live this Christian life, I have to be different, I can't stand with them, and they mock and they ridicule and they make fun of it and say, oh, I bet you wish you could be over here where we are. Just remember this, that there's going to come a day where they're going to wish they could be in the congregation of the righteous. They're going to wish they could stand and walk and sit where we are. But it's not going to happen. They're going to be driven away like dried up leaves, like chaff. They won't even begin to have a chance to sit down. Are you in John 16? The Bible, I'm going to read to you from Ephesians chapter 2. Okay, I'll read to you from Ephesians chapter 2. The Bible says in verse 4, God who is rich in mercy for his great love worth, he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ and hath raised us up and made us sit together in heavenly places. That's where we're sitting tonight. And I want you to notice, pay attention to what I'm reading to you, okay? Notice the tense here. When we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together in Christ and hath raised us up and made us sit together in heavenly places. It says he hath done this. That he hath made us to sit in heavenly places. That's past tense. Look, your seat, there is a, there is a, a seat reserved in heaven for you right now. There's a seat there with your name on it. It's already there. It's like you might as well already be sitting in heaven as far as Christ is in turn. In Christ Jesus, it's there. It's as good as done. Look, that should make not sitting with the scornful a little easier. Well, I can't sit here. I can't be a part of this world. I can't you know, enjoy the pleasures of sin that they're enjoying. 
I can't, I'm going to miss out on whatever it is that they are make, making out to be so great. Give it time. You'll see that it's not so great. But understand this, that you might not have that seat here, down here, but you have that seat up there with Christ. It's as good as done. It's past tense. He hath made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So stop worrying about the wicked. Stop worrying about what they think. What opinion they have of us. Or how they're going to treat you. It doesn't matter. You know, and stop worrying about what they're going to do. And this is just a message that cannot be preached enough in 2020. Because there's just so many Christians just biting their nails, worrying about the ungodly. About how... You know, we're all just, the, the one world financial system is going to enslave us all. Yeah, it's in the Bible. We already know that. But I'm not worried about it. All right. You know, look, we already know these things are, come to, are going to come to pass as he hath told us. But, we are, you know, but fear not, little flock. Look at verse, John chapter 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Where is peace today? It's in Christ. It's in this, I, I mean, is it, is it a literal place you can go in Christ? You know, is Christ just going to say, come on in? It's, it's something you do by faith. It's, something, it's a spiritual exercise. It's, a, it's an understanding that we are in Christ, that we have been made to sit in heavenly places, that the, there bad things are going to happen in this world, but there's no reason to fear because we have peace in Him. If, if we don't walk with the ungodly, if we don't stand in the seat of the, or sit in the seat of the scornful, but if we walk in him, if we're with God's people, there's peace to be had. People are, are freaking out over this election. They're losing their minds. They're so worried. Oh, who's going to get voted? Oh, can you imagine what's going to happen if Biden gets in there? They're, 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 they're scared. You, you expect me to not believe that there aren't Born again, God's children, Christians out there today that aren't just fretting themselves over this election, I guarantee you it's out there. They're, 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 they're losing sleep at night because they're so worried about it. But he says, look, in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. Mark it down. Don't go in the Christian life thinking, oh, this is going to be easy. This will be a cakewalk. No, you're going to have tribulation. Might as well mark that down. But here's the problem. People say, well, I don't want the tribulation, so I'm just going to go along and get along. And you can go ahead and do that, but you know what? You're not going to be that tree. You're not going to be like that tree planted by the rivers of water. That's not going to be you. you don't expect the peace that, that, that passeth all understanding. Because that peace is only found in Him. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Saying, and you know what? You're going to have tribulation and you should probably get on some antidepressants. And you should probably go ahead and just, you know, go through life moping about how hard it is. You know, be of good cheer. Good, good cheer. Why? I have overcome the world. Again, past tense. I have overcome it. Now, I will. It's as good as done. Christ is going to return on a white horse. We're going to be with him. The dead in Christ are going to rise. The we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. You know, if we, were, if we remain unto his coming, we'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We're going to watch him defeat all God's enemies, set up the, the thousand-year millennial reign. This isn't just some Baptist fairy tale. This is Bible. And then we're going to go into you know, Armageddon. That's going to last. That's going to be a blip on the radar of eternity. And then it's, it's a world, an unknown world with God himself, the Father on earth. That's as good as done. So what are we worried about the ungodly for? Who are like the chaff? You know, they got the guns and the missiles and the vaccines and the one world currency. I'm not going to sit here and bite my nails over it because there, it's, it's all that stuff. A thousand years into an eternity, you're going to be Donald who? Joe Biden, huh? United States of what? It's not even, even going to... You'll forget about it. Those people are going to be like the chaff that just goes into it, just, non just driven away. They won't even be around for us to think about. 
He says there, For the Lord knoweth the, the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The way of the ungodly shall perish. And Christians, they need to get a forward-thinking mentality today and start to understand that we are not of this world, that our, that our kingdom is not of this world, that ours is the world to come and, and start to invest in that world and quit worrying so much about this one. And understand that all these things that are taking place, all these ungodly that are prospering in the world, they're all going to perish. So, you know, if you want peace, you have to understand something that it only comes to those who have chosen to walk with the Lord. Say, well, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. Why don't I have the peace? Are you walking with God? Are you reading His Word? Are you praying? Are you going to church? Are you trying to live for Him? I mean, why else, you know, why else is God going to, to, to give you that peace? <laughs> I mean, that's what He said there in, uh, uh, where was I? He said, as the light is in the law of the Lord. That's the guy that's going to get the peace, the guy who delights in the Lord. Perfect peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Perfect peace, complete, whole, entire peace, that passeth all understanding. Perfect peace have they which what? Love thy law, thy word. That love it, that read it, that obey it, that implement it in their life. They're the ones that have peace. And when you see Christians today, that are, are worried about the ungodly, which are just going to be driven away like chaff one day, when they're fretting and worrying and trying to make everybody else worried about it, mark it down. They don't love his, they don't love, they don't love his law. How else do you explain it? How else do you explain that? How can a Christian sit there and be so overly concerned about all the wicked things in the world and worried about it and, and biting their nails over it? If the Bible says, perfect peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. How else do you explain that? Look, if Christians are worried, it's a lack of faith. It's a lack of spiritual foresight on their part. And they need to just get their head in that book and start to actually believe what it says. That I have overcome the world. And if they could get that through their head, you know what they might find? They might find that they could obey the commandment to be of good cheer. Let's go ahead and pray.